I, I just had some coffee in there because I had some remains. I'm, I'm actually good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, let us uh, continue with um, uh, this uh, sutta to Maha. Nama, the uh, Buddha's cousin, uh, and uh, the Buddha has just taught him how to uh, recollect the Buddha uh, and how to think about the Buddha in the right way, uh, uh, in a kind of very impersonal terms, but just in terms of the wisdom faculty, the understanding, and also uh, the Buddha as the supreme teacher. Uh, so make these recollections a little bit your own if you can, uh, uh, because uh, they can become very useful if you're able to relate to that, to relate to the Buddha as your actual teacher. Uh, and as I've said many times before, one of the things to remember about this, one of the things that I always found very powerful and a useful way of thinking about the Buddha, is to remember that the Buddha, when he taught these teachings, uh, he knew that these teachings would be going on in the world for a long, long time into the future. Uh, he knew that they were going to go on from century to century and from culture to culture. Uh, and that is why he said that he set in, w in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. Yeah, the idea of the wheel of the Dhamma is like this idea of this teaching rolling on in the world uh, and rolling from place to place, rolling from century to century and carrying on. So when the Buddha gave these teachings, uh, he gave them in such a way that they were universal uh, and they were applicable to everyone. Uh, there's very little um, kind of cultural trappings, if you like, uh, in the suttas. There's obviously a little bit uh, because they existed in a particular culture, uh, but they are teachings that are universal, that speak to universal traits for human beings, or not just humans, but any being almost at all. Uh, and this is what makes them so powerful, and this is what makes them so transferable yeah, between people. Wherever you go, people can understand these teachings, uh, and that is what you're seeing in the world. So the Buddha, he thought about that. So because he thought about that, uh, he thought about everyone. Uh, everyone can legitimately call themselves a disciple of the Buddha, because he thought about people in the future. And I always like to think in this way that he thought about us sitting here today, together in the BGF. Yeah, because we are part of that future. Uh, we're part of a foreign country far away from the Buddha. Uh, and once you feel that the Buddha is teaching you directly uh, in the suttas, uh, he's actually thinking about us, uh, then it becomes more, much more powerful, much more personal. Uh, it's like he's there. He really is your teacher. Uh, and uh, so just by reading these books, uh, then you are, in a sense, hanging out with the Buddha. Yeah, that's what you're doing. This is kind of the nice thing about this. Uh, so it's all about how we relate to these teachings. Uh, and if you relate to them in the right way, they become far more powerful as a consequence. Uh, so uh, what the Buddha says then, he says that uh, uh, when, you, when the noble disciple recollects the Tathagata yeah, in this particular way, on that occasion his mind or their mind is not obsessed by desire ill will or confusion. Uh, and uh, the reason is because you're thinking about the Dhamma in the right way when that, w when that works, uh, and because you're thinking about the Dhamma in the right way, uh, the hindrances have no scope because you know what matters, what is important, what works and what doesn't work, uh, so the hindrances just get blown away. Uh, so these things are gone. Uh, on that occasion, your mind is simply straight based on the Tathagata. Uh, and uh, the idea, in, again, found in the suttas is that if your mind is full of defilements, it is crooked, a crooked mind, uh, yeah? which is kind of not, not you don't see things straight. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, related to the idea of ujjukaditi as well, straight view. You have a straightness of mind, you're not bent and, and distorted, full of vested interest and all of these kind of things. Uh. A noble disciple whose mind is straight gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains joy connected with the Dhamma. And uh, here again, as I mentioned before, this idea of uh, inspiration in the meaning, this is Atta Veda, and uh, inspiration in the Dhamma is Dhamma Veda. The idea of the word Veda is a mixture of feeling and understanding. Uh, so inspiration actually is a very nice word for that, uh, where you both understand what is going on uh, 
And because of that, you get some emotions coming with it, positive emotions uh, of joy and happiness uh, uh, because of that. Uh. S and, the, and the Atta Veda, uh, understand the inspiration with the meaning, uh, is uh, Atta here means meaning, it also means the goal and the purpose. Yeah, It means what the Dhamma is looking towards. The Dhamma is like the teaching. Yeah? The Dhamma is the teaching of the Buddha. It is the doctrine, if you like, of these teachings. Uh, and then the purpose of these teachings is the Atta, where they are going, what they are leading to, what they give rise to. Uh, the happiness, Nibbana, all of these kind of things. Yeah? The purpose of these things, the meaning of life, if you like, and all of that. Uh, so you have the teachings that are there and then the purpose of these teachings uh, and you get really inspired by that because you understand what this is about. Uh. So, um, and then because you are inspired and because inspiration always is conjoined with a sense of emotion or whatever, uh, that emotion is the joy that arises as a consequence. Uh. So here, what you are seeing here is very similar to what we're seeing with the five spiritual faculties. Uh, the inspiration, when you feel inspired, uh, you know what it's like when you feel inspired, you often get energy, yeah? Inspiration gives rise to energy because you want to act on that inspiration. So this is very similar to the energy in the five faculties. Uh, so from the faith, uh, from recalling the Buddha in the right way, uh, yeah? then the energy arises because you understand what this is about. This is meaningful, this is powerful, uh, this is what life is about, this is what I should be devoting myself to. Uh, the energy arises. Uh, and from that energy then, here you see the joy is connected with that. This is the piti. Who is it? Maybe not. not it's probably not piti actually. It's probably something else. Uh, uh, is it? Uh, it's pamuja. Pa yeah, pamuja. Piti is the next one. Uh, yeah. so, so far only pamuja. So the uh, uh, pamuja arises, the, the gladness or the joy in the heart arises from that. Uh, and uh, then you have the standard sequence of uh, dependent liberation that comes from that, that we have already seen before. Uh, and then it says from when one is joyful, the rapture, the piti arises. Uh, yeah, this is now you are kind of moving from reflection to meditation uh, and this is one of those things. So you reflect on the Buddha and then based on that joy you kind of you do more a meditative thing like watching the breath or metta or something like that. Uh, the joy arises and, uh, uh, and then uh, f the from the joy the rapture comes. The one with the rapturous mind becomes tranquil uh, and the one who is tranquil feels pleasure. Uh, and the one for one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes stilled. Uh, and this is the standard sequence of uh, dependent liberation that we saw uh, before, uh, uh, and which has exactly shows you how the process of meditation happens psychologically, how it should feel when it works in the right way. And here, based on recalling the Buddha. And uh, so here, once you have the... Uh, Inspiration and the joy connected with the Dhamma, you feel the rapture. In this is also mindfulness, yeah, because when the joy becomes so powerful, mindfulness is automatic because you're just enjoying being in the present moment. Uh, and then as that deepens, as the pleasure becomes deeper and deeper, your mind becomes more and more focused on the joy and happiness, eventually it is stilled, uh, concentrated samadhi, samadhi indriya. So you see how one indriya arising after the other through this particular process. Uh, yeah, so the indriyas are connected. And once you see this, you start to understand how connected all the teachings of the Buddha are, how they all kind of work together. Here is a, uh, here is a teaching on how to uh, use the recollections to attain samadhi. Uh, it is very similar to dependent liberation that we have seen before. I've already shown you how dependent liberation is very closely related to the seven factors of awakening. Uh, and I'm also showing you how it works with the five faculties. Yeah? And they're all different angles, if you like, uh, on the same thing. Uh, and they all point to the same thing. And when you look at them from the different angles, uh, it gives like a complete picture, a more complete picture of what is going on. Uh, it's all very integrated. It is one jigsaw puzzle with many pieces that kind of fit into each other and give you one picture. And that picture is the Dhamma. That picture is uh, uh, the path, the, the sutta is basically the overall picture uh, of what is going on, the Four Noble Truths, or what you want to call it. Uh. So uh, then you gain the uh, 
tranquility, you gain the stillness of the mind, and of course that stillness of the mind is then the foundation for wisdom. Yeah, that is kind of also where that dependent liberation sequence continues. Uh, so then he says to Mahanama, he says to Mahanama that uh, uh, this is called a noble disciple who dwells in balance amidst an unbalanced population, who dwells unafflicted amidst an un unafflicted population, who has entered the stream of the Dhamma, he develops recollection of the Buddha. So you are balanced because uh, when your mind is full of defilements, you are unbalanced. Uh, your mind is going this way, going that way. Uh, it doesn't have that equanimity and balance. Uh, you don't have a sense of uh, being in, con in charge of your mind. External forces are in charge uh, and your mind is being dragged along uh, and you don't really know what's going on. Uh, so you're out of balance. You are afflicted because this is also a state of suffering. Yeah? When the mind is being dragged around like that, you don't have a feeling of being in charge of yourself. Uh, you feel you are basically suffering. Uh, desires arising and coming, uh, ill will arising and passing away. Uh, and uh, it is uh, not a very nice state to be in. Uh, and uh, the more peaceful your mind is, uh, the more samadhi, the more stillness, the more mindfulness you have, uh, the more happy and content your life tends to be. Because, in part, because you feel in charge of yourself. Uh, I'm in charge, rather than defilements being in charge. Uh, Mara being in charge. Uh, that's bad news, right? Uh, Mara being in charge is no good. As one, as one who has entered the stream of the Dhamma, he recollects the Buddha. So this again is the idea of him being a stream entry. You have entered the stream of the Dhamma. Uh, Dhamma Sotang Samapanno. Dhamma Sotang, literally stream of the Dhamma, is that what that is referring to here. So that is how the recollection of the Buddha ideally leads to Samadhi and all of this. And uh, of course, very sometimes it does not lead to Samadhi. Yeah, I I'm sure you haven't, you, most, most people don't get to Samadhi every time they think in this way. Uh, but uh, it is an ideal to kind of aim for, and it is something to uh, reflect on. And even if you just get a little bit of feeling for the Buddha, who he is, uh, that will already be a help, uh, be a help on this path. Uh. And uh, sometimes you just have to know about these various things, uh, and then you find the kind of uh, recollection that is most valuable in your own practice. Uh. So that is one way of doing it. But as I mentioned before, the uh, idea of the faith faculty can also take other forms. You can have the faith in the Dhamma, for example, and sometimes people uh, relate better to some things than to others. Uh, and uh, so this is the next one here, is about how you uh, use the faith in the Dhamma to give rise to a similar kind of sequence. Uh, and the Buddha says here, uh, or again Mahanama, a noble disciple recollects the Dhamma in this way. Uh, the Dhamma is well expounded by the Buddha directly visible, immediate, uh, inv inviting one to come and see, uh, applicable uh, to be personally experienced by the wise. And then exactly the same thing happens afterwards, yeah, when a noble disciple recollects the Dhamma. On that occasion, their mind is not obsessed by desire, ill will and confusion. Uh, on, that on that occasion, their mind is simply straight, uh, based on the Dhamma. A noble disciple whose mind is straight gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains joy connected with the Dhamma. So here, using the Dhamma as a similar kind of a, a reflection, uh, you gain this joy in these teachings uh, that have this ability to uh, take you uh, to uh, all these things that you ever wanted in your life. Uh, these are these teachings that are so uh, that actually work in this way. Uh, and of course, once you get that, uh, once you get this idea that these teachings have the potential to take you all the way to the highest happiness possible, uh, you start to become pretty inspired. Yeah, but, yet, but the problem is we don't really understand that, and that is why we don't have that inspiration fully. Uh, but once you get that, that these are the most profound and beautiful teachings that give you everything you ever wanted, uh, of course, it becomes very easy to feel joy. Wow, this is what these teachings mean. Uh, and sometimes you get a little bit of feeling for that, uh, and then you get really uplifted uh, as a consequence. Uh, so, um, uh, 
it's kind of strange sometimes how we kind of can get inspired by worldly things, yeah, and how worldly things can sometimes uh, lift you up and make you feel inspired. You, you look in a, some kind of brochure, you see a nice holiday destination, you get really inspired. Wow, it was so wonderful, so beautiful, let's go. And then when you read about the Dhamma, you think, yeah, yeah, whatever, uh, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> it's like we've got things completely the wrong way around, uh, and this is part of the problem here. Uh. And this is why uh, this is, uh, it, takes, it takes a bit of e extra effort to gain this inspiration. So um, just very briefly, what, does, what do these things mean? What does it mean that the Dhamma is well expounded? And uh, uh, it means a number of things, but, and we have seen some of those things already. So one thing it means that we saw already is that there's nothing superfluous and nothing missing in the Dhamma. That's already a very useful thing to remember. Uh, yeah, nothing superfluous. In other words, uh, there's nothing you can just chuck out and say, yeah, yeah, let's let's leave, let's just take seven factors of the noble eightfold path or something like that. That doesn't, then it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah? so <laughs> it's, that's important. Uh, uh, and there's nothing missing. You don't actually have to add anything. Yeah? You don't need anything more than the suttas to take you all the way to awakening. They are complete. They are a full path. Uh, that is also very useful to to know because sometimes we add too much to the Dhamma, we make it too complicated, we make it into a philosophical system, uh, we add things that the Buddha didn't, didn't say. Sometimes we need to add little things to explain it, but we have to be careful not to go too far in adding too much, uh, because sometimes adding what we're doing is actually subtracting. Uh. By adding, we're subtracting, we're losing kind of the beauty of the original and the directness of the original teachings. Uh, so sometimes addition isn't addition at all, it's actually subtraction. Uh. So, uh, the, so the Buddha expounded it well, he specifically says elsewhere that uh, uh, they are laid down with the right meaning and right phrasing, yeah, sa attang sa and uh, meaning that the Buddha, uh, in part, sa means that the Phrasing is done very carefully here. It is done carefully so as to reflect the meaning and to be as, uh, as simple and direct as possible. Uh, again, the, the words have meaning. Yeah? Every word has a meaning. Every word is there for a purpose. Uh. So these are some of the uh, ideas behind it is well expounded. Yeah? You, and once you get that, uh, you take it all very seriously. You look at it with great care as a consequence. Uh. It is directly visible. This is Sanditika. Uh, immediate, akalika. Um, what has uh, Adan Sudato translated this as uh, immediately effective, realizable, realizable in this very life, and immediately effective. Uh. So th both of these words means that these are things you can experience in this life. Uh. Yeah, they have th these have these two are synonyms basically visible in this life and immediately effective. It means that it relates to this life rather than the future life, uh, and this is one of the important things about Buddhism, which again makes it kind of stand out. Uh, everything in Buddhism can be realized now. You don't have to wait till after you're dead. Uh, yeah, it's always a bit risky after you're dead because you don't know. Uh, yeah, you don't know what's going to happen after you're dead. Uh, so it's a bit risky. So it's kind of reassuring that it can be realized now in this very life. Uh. So this is one meaning. So all these aspects that you read about here, Nibbana, the jhanas, insights and everything else, uh, uh, can be had, uh, can be realized in this very life. Uh. But it means more than that. It also means in one sense that uh, you can experience the Dhamma actually in this moment. Uh. How can you how can you do that? How can you realize it in this very moment? Uh, obviously, it may not be possible to gain a jhana in this very moment, or even become nibbana in this very moment. Uh, that may not be possible because you have to develop the various things. Uh, but there are aspects of the dhamma that you can realize straight away. Uh, and why? How is that? And uh, to see that is a nice story that I usually tell on every every retreat. So I probably told it here many times before, but that's kind of, that's okay. I don't mind telling it again here. And this is a story from the suttas of this monk called Samidhi. And uh, Samidhi, he is living in Rajaga, in the hot springs in Rajaga. Yeah, and quite a few, few of you have been to Rajaga, is that right? Uh, yeah, you've been to Rajaga before, so you know Rajaga. And uh, when you go to Rajaga, what do you find today, two and a half thousand years later? Hot springs, uh, yeah. Nothing has changed in Rajagaha, just like everywhere else in India, it's still all the same. Uh. 
So that it's kind of nice when you go there and the, the hot springs are described in the suit as they are there. You go to exactly that place and lo and behold, hot springs. Uh, that's what you find there. Uh, it's kind of, it's nice. Yeah, it makes everything very real. It's a bit more developed now, of course, but uh, it's still, it is there. Uh, and uh, so he is there, he's bathing in the hot springs and uh, so this monk Samidhi, he comes out afterwards and he's kind of drying himself, yeah. And then as he's there, this Devata comes down, uh, yeah. And this Devata tells him, uh, I hope I get this right, I hope I don't mess it up because I haven't got the sutta here, but the Devata says to him, listen, you're a young man, uh, yeah, you are uh, and youthful, he was probably still, maybe still in his twenties or something like that, yeah. Black hair, you know, everything is, you've got everything ahead of you. Why are you wasting your time uh, with this Dhamma where the results come in the future? Uh, when you could be enjoying yourself with sensuous pleasures, uh, you can get straight away. Uh. Yes? Is the Dhamma right? Uh, it's true, isn't it? Uh, dhamma, who knows about the Dhamma? It is somewhere far away in the future, yeah? Nibbana, no, nothing about Nibbana. Sensual pleasures are right, right here, right away. Uh, and most people will kind of agree with that Devata, yeah? Because Devata has a point. Uh. But of course, it is not as simple as that. Uh, so then uh, uh, Samidhi replies, no, that is not true. It is the Dhamma that is available here now. It is essential pleasures that are in the future. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the uh, Devata is perplexed. Uh, I don't understand. Uh, what do you mean by this? Uh, and uh, then they go to the Buddha and the Buddha kind of reaffirms that uh, Samidhi is right in, in the way he's saying this. Uh, and. Uh, the point here, the point of this, and this is kind of how this works out, and, and most people have some kind of, uh, uh, kind of agreement with the Devata, but also some suspicion there might be something deeper going on here, yeah? Something, maybe there's something deeper going on here. Yeah? And of course, uh, uh, the point here is that with craving, yeah, with the sensual pleasures, uh, because it is always about craving, sensual pleasures are really always about the future. We're always pursuing things, always going after it. Uh, very rarely do we have the things right here. Most of the time, 95% of the time, it is about craving and going after something else. Uh, always moving forward, always being restless, always being agitated, trying to find that satisfaction which we think that the sensual pleasures will give us. Actually, we shouldn't think it, but uh, somehow that craving keeps on lying to us uh, and we keep on falling for it and we keep on running after it. Uh. So by definition, almost, sensual pleasures are almost always this kind of future thing that we're running after. As long as they are craving, uh, you are running to the future. And if you look into yourself, the craving is, very, is a very constant companion on the, Buddhist, on the human path. Uh. But uh, the Dhamma, if you live it in the right way, uh, yeah, if you do it rightly, uh, uh, and if you, in this very moment, uh, you are able to turn your mind in the right way uh, and have a kind thought, uh, if you are able in this very moment to do an act of generosity or kindness to somebody, uh, if you are able to turn your mind in the right direction, straight away uh, you gain that joy and inspiration connected with the Dhamma and with the teachings uh, that are found right here in this particular sutta. Uh, that is available at all times, as long as you move your mind in the right direction. Uh, yeah? And that is basically what it means, is that every moment uh, there is a choice between following the worldly cravings and the uh, defilements of the mind or whatever, and not doing that, and moving in a different direction, and giving rise to a whols wholesome state of mind. Uh, and if you are able to give rise to that wholesome state of mind, uh, you can feel the benefit straight away. Uh, the craving dying down, feeling more content, uh, feeling more happy, and the joy coming up with that. Uh. So this is the point of this. Uh. So remember, this is when we talked about the, the other day about um, uh, the sensual pleasures being like a dream. That is the kind of a dream that is always a little bit out of reach, uh, somewhere in the future, yeah? Somewhere kind of not quite here yet, uh, and it keeps on being like that, yeah? Uh, Year after year, lifetime after lifetime, there's always a little bit out of reach, uh, always moving towards something, uh, never really getting what we're looking for. Uh. So this is kind of the idea behind this, and this is uh, why, in a very deep sense, the, uh, the Dhamma is available right here and now, and of course, in a, in a more profound sense, uh, it is available in this life, in the sense that if you keep on practicing this, uh, if you keep on doing the right thing, moment after moment, uh, then eventually these profound things will al also happen as a consequence. Uh. So, that is, uh, uh, that, is how, that is how I understand these things. Uh. And, um, then you have the idea of in 
inviting one to come and see Ehi Pasikoha. And uh, so uh, uh, this, uh, who was there, w there was a nice translation of that one that I saw s some time ago. Or, yeah, it doesn't matter. So the idea that you, uh, these things are there, for available for you. If you go and you practice accordingly, uh, then you will, you will see them. Yeah? If you practice them in the right way, they will happen to you. And um, so very similar to the previous ones. Uh, and then you have the next one, which is here translated as applicable uh, and relevant, I think, by Ajahn Sujato. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, this is the word opanai, opanaiko. Uh, and uh, one way of translating the word opanaiko that I like uh, is uh, the idea of leading onward. Uh, yeah, leading you towards uh, a goal. And every little step, you actually realize some of the benefits of the Dhamma. And this is one of those things that I think is very important to do if you are serious about the Buddhist practice uh, and you're interested in meditation and you're interested in living your life according to these teachings. Uh, one of the things you should always do is should ask yourself, uh, is it leading onward? Uh, do I experience a change in my life? Uh, am I getting a little bit more mindful than I was a few months ago or a year ago? Uh, am I becoming a more soft and caring person? Uh, in my mind, becoming more still when I try to watch the breath? Uh, is my anger and ill will, is it going down? Uh, am I feeling more contented, less craving as a person? Uh, do I have more clarity of mind, uh, less confusion and these kind of problems? Uh, so you can see the idea is to increase uh, the good qualities uh, and decrease the bad ones. That is the meaning of leading onward. Uh, yeah? And this should be happening uh, in us uh, uh, because this is kind of the benefit of the path. And every day or every month or whatever, whenever, however often you measure yourself, you see these things happen. Uh, you feel encouragement uh, because you know that this path works. Uh. So this is what it is all about. So you ask yourself, yeah, you come on a retreat, you go on a retreat a couple of times a year or three times or four times, I don't know how many times a year you go on a retreat, but you know, every uh, few months or every year, you ask yourself, have I made some sort of progress? Uh, is it going in the right direction? Uh, yeah? And that is where you start to become very, get a lot of encouragement. And if it isn't, if you don't see any progress, uh, you have to ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, and when you investigate carefully, uh, you will start to see the reasons why it isn't working. What is it that's stopping you? And usually it will be, uh, almost always, there's a flaw somewhere in our sila, in our conduct, that is a problem. Uh, uh, and that conduct, I mean in a very deep sense, uh, the way you think about things, the way you reflect on the world, uh, uh, not enough kindness perhaps, or not enough uh, uh, compassion for, for the world around you. Uh, uh, this is a very important part of that. Uh, too much attachments to the sensual world perhaps. Uh, some of the reflections we were talking about the other day can be useful to guide your mind a little bit more towards the spiritual life. Uh. So this is uh, Opanaiko, leading onwards on the path. Uh, and uh, this is what I have been doing for 23 years as a monk. Uh, and uh, what I see is uh, an enormous change over those 23 three years, uh, the movement forwards at all times. Uh, and this is what kind of a very important part that inspires me to continue on this path. Uh, once you stagnate, you kind of start losing the meaning, m losing the purpose. Uh, yeah, you start wondering, is the Buddha right? Uh, maybe it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, that's what you start to think if you stagnate too much. Uh, uh, so it's actually very, very important and significant uh, to have that sense of purpose to lead you onwards. Uh, the Buddha said that uh, this path works uh, if you practice it right. Uh, so if you have that faith, then you will uh, find the solution to the obstacles by just trying hard enough. Uh, you will find the solutions, uh, maybe not hard enough, but being wise enough, I should say. Uh, and then you will continue forward as a consequence. Uh. So it takes that uh, commitment and it takes the honesty to be able to work these things out. Uh. And then you have the last one, which is to be personally experienced by the wiser. Yeah, so uh, you, you've got to be wiser. Otherwise you have a problem. Huh? <laughs> Are you wiser? <laughs> hard to know, yeah, it's hard to know. Are you wise? You try to look at yourself, you don't really know whether you're wise or not. Uh, how, wise, how wise are you? Uh, and uh, of course the point is that uh, if, you have, if you're even here, you must be reasonably wise, yeah? Otherwise you wouldn't be here, you'd be doing something else. Uh, so that's already a really good start. Uh, so, uh, but, um, 
So the point is that we don't know how much wisdom we have, so we just start with what we have, uh, and then we kind of move on from there. You assume that you are wise enough, yeah? That is what really matters. You are wise enough, uh, because again, you wouldn't be interested in these teachings at all if you hadn't some degree of wisdom. You would just kind of reject them out of hand uh, and think that they are nonsense. There are more important things in the world to do than to kind of mess around with this theoretical stuff in the suttas, yeah? Something like that. Uh. So, uh, uh, then, of course, then when you think about these teachings in this way, that you are in your hands is the manual for achieving the highest happiness in the world. Whoa! Then you start kind of, uh, you know, you, 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 it makes you so it makes you so happy that you actually there is such a thing even available in the world that can give you the highest happiness, and then that whole same sequence happens again. Uh, again, inspiration, the Dhamma joy with the Dhamma, from the joy comes the rapture, from the rapture comes the tranquility. Tranquility gives rise to pleasure, pleasure gives rise to stillness. And then you live in balance, you live unafflicted, and you are one who has entered the stream of the Dhamma, you develop recollection of the Dhamma. So, uh, that is the recollection of the Dhamma. Uh, now, we have the recollection of the Sangha, uh, yeah, because we're talking about the three kinds of uh, recollections here, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So let's have a quick look at that one as well. Uh, the Buddha says, again, Mahanama, a noble disciple recollects the Sangha thus. Uh, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way, practicing the straight way, practicing the true way, practicing the proper way. Um, that is the four pairs of persons, the eight types of individuals. Uh, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is worthy of gifts, uh, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, uh, worthy of reverential salutation, the unsurpassed field of merit for the world. Uh, and when you think like that, uh, this is what may happen. Uh, when you recollect the Sangha, on that occasion your mind is not obsessed by desire, ill will and confusion. Uh, on that occasion, your mind is simply straight, based on the Sangha. A noble disciple whose mind is strained gains inspiration in the meaning, inspiration in the Dhamma, joy connected with the Dhamma, and then the whole sequence just as before. Um. So the Sangha here is the Aryan Sangha, the noble Sangha is what is meant by this. Uh. That's why it says the four pairs and the eight types of individuals. Uh, in other words, those who have internalized the teachings uh, and those who are practicing the sure way to Nibbana. <coughs> <coughs> and this is why they are practicing the good way, Supatipanno. They're practicing the good way because they have internalized the path and they are always practicing heading in the right direction, really. Uh, and the straight way is similar to that. Uh, are, it is straight again because they uh, know what they're doing. Uh, so they're kind of heading always in the right direction, not missing the path. Uh, as uh, people who are non area sometimes will miss the path uh, because you don't know what it is uh, apart from in theory. Practicing the true way, uh, uh, and this is, uh, uh, practice, this is the Nyaya Patipano, Nyaya Patipano, and the Nyaya is. Uh, uh, one thing that is in the suttas, it is the uh, dependent origination. So you are kind of practicing the path towards the cessation because you are reducing a vidya at the beginning. So you are at the, you know, the 12 links of dependent origination that start off with the avidja, end up with dukkha. So you're practicing that cessation sequence by reducing avidja. Eventually the whole sequence ceases uh, and suffering itself ceases. Uh. And you're practicing the proper way, samichi patipanno. And this is the idea, again, that it is proper because you know what it is uh, and you, you know what you are doing here. So the Sangha is, uh, this is why the Sangha is special, because the, 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 the Aryan Sangha is special, because you have internalized the Dhamma. The Dhamma is lodged inside your heart and mind, uh, and you have no choice uh, but to follow along according to that. Uh. And these are the four pairs of persons, the eight types of individuals. Uh, these are all the noble ones. Uh, and then it says, this uh, Sangha of the noble ones' disciples are worthy of gifts, uh, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, uh, worthy of reverential salutation, Anjali, Anjali, uh, the unsurpassed field of merit for the world. Uh, 
And uh, why is that? Well, the reason is because they are potential teachers. Uh, yeah, they are teachers and the teaching they have uh, is the most interesting teaching in the whole world. Uh, when you ever have gratitude to a teacher, you go to university, you have a really good professor, or you have a teacher early on in school who teaches you something, if it's a good teacher, you feel so happy about having a good teacher. You learn something, uh, and you feel that you are given a gift uh, of their teaching. Uh. You go to medical school, you have a really good medical professor who teaches you medicine, uh, and you really grasp what is going on, and you have a degree of gratitude to that uh, 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 excellent or special teacher with special gifts for teaching or whatever it is, uh, and you feel gratitude. Uh. But still, the happiness that they give you is still fairly ordinary. Uh. They give you the happiness of learning your trade, uh, the ability to then make a living later on, which of course we all have to make a living, so they have given you something very valuable. Uh. Yeah, so it is valuable, but uh, still, it is not the final kind of happiness. It's not the ultimate thing. Uh, uh, your parents, you could say the same thing, that uh, your parents are called the Pubacharya in the suttas. The Pubacharya means like the first teachers or the ancient teachers. Uh, yeah? uh, and because your parents, they teach us so much. Uh, and actually, they, if there's anyone in the sutta that is compared to the Aryas, the noble ones, uh, it is the parents. Uh, they are such important teachers. But again, they learn us how to teach us how to survive, to teach us how to function in the world, uh, but they're not really able to give us the highest kind of teaching. And this is what the noble ones do, with the Buddha being the primary example of the noble ones. Uh, they have a chance to give us teachings uh, that actually have to do with fulfilling the very meaning of life, uh, finding the highest happiness, uh, eliminating all suffering. Uh, yeah, this is why reading the suttas is so powerful. That's exactly where it comes from. Uh, and noble people have exactly the same ability. Uh. So, uh, and then of course, if someone gives you the highest gift, in terms of the highest teachings, uh, then they are worthy of gifts in return, just like we give gifts to people that we respect in the world. Uh. This is why you would say the noble ones are worthy of gifts. This is what, where it comes from. This is the whole idea behind this. Uh. It's a kind of mutual exchange and a mutual ex uh, support. Uh. Worthy of hospitality, similar kind of thing. Uh, and um, worthy of offerings, same thing again. Worthy of reverential salutation, it just means that you have a degree of respect. Yeah, <coughs> When somebody has a special offering, that's really uh, all that that means. Uh. And then they are the unsurpassed field of merit for the world. Uh, and uh, this is bec because, uh, you know, the Buddha always says that if you uh, give an offering, the more pure the recipient is, uh, then the more um, merit, the higher is the source of merit for that. Uh, and uh, probably in part because you are aware of that purity, so it affects you when you give to someone who is very pure. You feel very good about that because you know that there, sometimes you know that there is a purity behind that and you, you support that. Uh. So, uh, so that is the Sangha. So how do we know who these people are? How, do, how, how can we kind of find the Arahant so we can make max merit in the world? Uh, what is kind of, uh, how, what is the trick to that? Uh. <laughs> And uh, the trick is that, uh, and this is what, what the Buddha always recommends, is to give to the Sangha as a whole. Uh, don't think about individuals, uh, rather the Sangha as a whole is that field, uh, because within the Sangha is the place where you're most likely to find individuals who have these qualities. Uh. And sometimes it is actually very useful to um, reflect on uh, the Sangha and even reflect on some of the members of the Sangha and how they live their lives. Uh, because some of the way that some of these monastics in particular live their life in the world is actually very inspiring. Uh, it is quite, you know, it's quite uh, uh, also quite uh, remarkable how the, uh, someone can actually live uh, in such a way as some of these Sangha members live. Uh. And some of my favorite examples are some of the monks in Sri Lanka who live really far away in the jungle. And they spend almost all their time in the jungle. Uh, 51 weeks of the year they live in the jungle. Uh. There's one monk who I'm aware of, uh, uh, and he, uh, he lives in a three-walled kuti in the jungle in Sri Lanka. Every day he goes into the local village uh, and he receives alms food. Uh, after receiving his alms food, he goes back to his kuti. Uh, the nearest other kuti is about 10 kilometers away, so you can't just pop by for a visit or anything like that. Uh, 
So when he's in his kuta, he doesn't talk to anybody. Huh? When he goes into the village, if they ask him a question, huh, he may reply briefly to a question, maybe give them a small animodana chant as a gratitude for the generosity. Huh? That's all the communication he does with people. Yeah? Almost nothing, almost zero throughout the day. Huh? And then in his kuti, what does he have in his kuti? Huh? Nothing, pretty much nothing. Huh? Yeah, he has his robes, he has his bowl, huh? maybe he has a book or two. What are those books? Majjhima Nikaya, Diga Nikaya, yeah, that kind of things. Uh, maybe he has a, a piece of paper and a pencil to write down uh, inspiring passages that he likes or something like that. Uh, but almost nothing in that kuti. Uh, there's no entertainment, there's nothing to do. Uh, all there's around you is jungle and forest and snakes and ants and uh, you know, other kind of nasty uh, beings. Uh, but actually, when you live in peace with nature, the nasty beings turn out not to be so nasty after all. Uh, they're quite friendly. Very often why they are nasty is because we think they are dangerous and bad for us. Uh, and we live in the city and we don't like them, we want to get rid of them. That's how they often end up as nasty. But if you live in the jungle with them, it, it's not so bad. Uh, you can live in harmony with these beings. Uh. So it's kind of astonishing, yeah, it's such an incredibly simple life. Uh, you don't see anybody, you don't talk to anybody, you don't have any entertainment, you've got nothing to do, apart from maybe repairing your little cutie, but the cutie is only tiny, 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 not, nothing much to repair either. So what do you do? You can sweep the ground around the cutie, you can only sweep the ground so much. Uh, so most of the time, that's th and this is the kind of the whole point, uh, most of the time you spend reflecting on the suttas, uh, meditating, uh, yeah, and that is really what you do, that is what your life is about. Uh. Now if you, most people spend their whole time living in a kuti in the forest somewhere, uh, having nothing to do except meditating and reflecting on the suttas and reading the suttas, uh, I can assure you, for most people, it would, after a while, you go crazy. Uh. Yeah, you come out of the jungle with big eyes, yeah, I'm enlightened, yeah, and actually you're nuts, that's the problem, uh, yeah. <laughs> Enlightened, there's a very kind of thin, kind of thin wall between being enlightened and being crazy. You go a little bit too wrong the wrong way, you go crazy, go the other way, you become enlightened. Uh, yeah? Actually, it's not, it's not really like that, uh, because what it, really, what it means is that if you have the right qualities uh, and you enter the jungle, uh, then it is not going to be bad, it's going to be good, uh, it's going to be really happy for you. But if you start out with the wrong qualities and then you enter the jungle, that is when you go crazy, huh? yeah? Because you start out with defilements or whatever, and those defilements get amplified when you are in solitude. Huh? But if your mind is pure, then the purity of your mind gets amplified in solitude. Huh? And the Buddha says this specifically in the suttas, unless you are ready, you should not go into solitude, huh? because you might go crazy, huh? yeah? Quite literally. Huh? So what is so inspiring about this is that these people who live like this, uh, and some of these monks have lived like this, there are not so many nuns who live quite in that kind of solitude. There are some very inspiring nuns as well who have lived in similar ways in solitude for three years in, you know, in a cave and that sort of thing. And this is uh, Tenzin Palm or in Tibet, and there are some nuns like that too. So it's not a gender specific thing, it just so happens that there are more monks around who live like this. Uh, uh, but it is extraordinarily inspiring. If you live like that for 30, 40 years, uh, the only time that you have uh, uh, with people is when you go into the village in the morning, you kind of say, you don't, some, most of them you don't say anything, occasionally you might say a little bit or something, uh, and then maybe you come out of the jungle once a year for a few days to have a Dhamma discussion with the people, and then you kind of disappear back into the jungle again, yeah, and you stay away for another 51 weeks. Uh, and if you live like that for 40 years, uh, and you know that these people, they have access to something else. Uh, they have access to some inner happiness, uh, they have access to some inner stability, some inner insight. Uh, and it gives you a feeling that there are things in this world that are outside and beyond what ordinary people experience. Uh, a profound happiness that makes you content. These people, the monk like, who lives like this in the jungle, is far more happy than anyone who lives in society. Uh, you see the wealthiest people in Malaysia, billions of dollars, uh, and they are kind of miserable compared to a monk like that. Uh, yeah, check out that money, run into the jungle, much better. Uh, yeah, actually don't do that because you go crazy instead, uh, but uh, you know. <laughs> But that's kind of the point. We just don't understand where happiness is to be found. We've got it all upside down. Uh. Yeah, I know some of these wealthy people, I know what they like. Uh, it is not worth it. <laughs> 
So, and so this gives us an uplift, it gives us this feeling that something is possible in the world uh, which is truly profound, truly meaningful, because it is possible to live in this way here. So this is this example of this monk in Sri Lanka, but of course we have people like that in our own monastery in Perth. Ajahn Brahm goes on retreat for six months, doesn't speak for a single person at all. He doesn't even go into the village. Absolute nobody for six months. Uh, and when he comes out, he is just, uh, you know, uh, very, very bright. I remember him when he came out, extremely bright. And uh, of course the first talk he gives is about six months of bliss. Uh, so, uh, so these are the kind of things that uh, give you this feeling that there is something, you know, profound going on in life. Uh, and this is a nice way of reflecting on the Sangha. Another story, this was also the same monk in Sri Lanka I was talking about now. He was, uh, because he was always living by himself, of course, he was very much in nature. And at one point he was trampled by an elephant, so his hip broke, so he walks with a limp, yeah, because of that. Uh, uh, so sometimes this can be dangerous. Uh, at one time he was sitting at the root of a tree, uh, meditating. Uh, yeah, and when you go into really deep meditation, uh, it's like you know, animals can't tell the difference between you and the tree. You look like a tree here, uh, because you are so still. Yeah? There's no breathing, nothing left. Uh, so the animals kind of can't tell the difference. So a snake came and kind of you know, went around him. Yeah? Just, but it wasn't going to kill him because it didn't know, it was just kind of hanging out there. Yeah? So, this, so when he woke up, there was a snake all around him. Uh, and some of these snakes are very, very dangerous. Just like snakes everywhere, I suppose. Uh, and he looked at this snake, he thought, oh, okay. <laughs> so he, would got, he, he, kind of, he, he realized, I've got to be very careful here. Uh, so what he, he just very slowly, he just lifted up his hand, really, really slowly, because if you make an abrupt movement, the snake will, ki will uh, kill you straight away. R lifts up his hand, yeah, and grasps the branch above him, holds onto the branch, and then says to the snake, okay, now please crawl up this arm and up into the, to the branch. And the snake looks at him and says, okay, and it kind of goes up. Uh, <laughs> it didn't say okay, I'm just kind of <laughs> I'm adding, adding a little bit there to the story to make it a bit more interesting, yeah. So that is one story, but even more astonishing is the famous story with Ajahn Ganha. I'm sure you heard this many times before, uh, where Ajahn Ganha is sitting in the forest together with his group of monks. Uh, and as they are sitting in meditation, uh, this, they hear something. Their eyes are obviously closed in meditation, they know what's going on, and the sound is becoming more and more obvious, uh, until they have to open their eyes to see what is going on. Uh, and as soon as they open their eyes, all the monks freeze in panic, uh, except for one monk, Ajahn Ganha. Yeah? And uh, as they are watching this uh, open their eyes, they see that there's a king cobra. King cobra can be really, really, some of the largest snakes in the world, uh, and incredibly dangerous. Have you got them here in Malaysia, king cobras? Uh, occasionally, yeah, occasionally you may, ha may have them. Uh, in Thailand they're called the one-step snake. You know why it's called the one-step snake? Because you've got one step left and then you're dead uh, after you're bitten. Uh, that's why it's called the one-step snake. Uh, so uh, this king cobra comes all the way up to Ajahn Ganha, yeah, and uh, uh, raises up, you know, I its hood, you know, and it hood puts out its hood and all these things, uh, and kind of looking Ajahn Ganha in the almost in the eye like this, uh, and uh, Ajahn Ganha is very is a very very cool monk. You know, someone was asking the other day, how can you stop being afraid of solitude? Well, he's one of these monks who's not afraid of solitude. He's not even afraid of king cobras. Uh, so he just, very, just like these other monks, he realizes, okay, no movement, yeah, or very, very gentle movements. Uh, so he take your arm, he took his ar arm up very, very gently, yeah, all the way up to the king cobra, all the way up to its head, uh, and then pats it on the, <laughs> on the head. <laughs> and then he says to the king cobra, okay, very nice of us to visit, visit us, you know, thank you for your visit. Uh, now please kind of move on. <laughs> and then the cobra, king cobra, moves on af after that. Uh, but uh, imagine doing that, yeah? You've got to be super duper cool to be able to do that. You have to have no fear of death, no fear of anything, basically, and a lot of metta, so much metta probably, that even the king cobra is kind of relaxing. Yeah, oh, okay, relax, yeah? There's nothing to be afraid of here. Yeah. This is what you feel like when you're around someone who has a lot of metta and kindness. You really relax, uh, and animals too relax around anyone who has a lot of metta. That is true for, you know, the pets that we have and anyone else. Uh, so quite likely that King Cobra also, even though reptiles are not famous for having much emotions, uh, exactly, it may be even that reptile actually had a little bit of feeling of that, and then it kind of went off as a consequence. Uh. 
So these are some of the things that happen, yeah, can happen when you develop this path to the highest potential. Uh, so this is a way of uh, reflecting on the Sangha, yeah, of people who are Aryas, uh, and to remind yourself that actually there is something astonishing going on with this path. Uh, it is possible to achieve things that almost nobody in this world can achieve. Uh, but it is available for anyone who is committed, anyone who perseveres can actually attain these things. Uh, and when you get that, it lifts up your mood, it lifts up your feeling that uh, this life is actually far more interesting uh, than people think it is. Uh, it is not just about doing all the ordinary things in life that everyone does. Uh, there's something much more going on behind the se scenes, uh, and it is accessible to each one of us. Uh. Anyway, so, uh, so this is one way of reflecting on the Sangha, and uh, also the, uh, the, the, uh, the way it is, of course, mentioned here by the Buddha, of course, uh, uh, and um, then the same thing happens as before. You gain the inspiration in the meaning, inspiration in the Dhamma, you gain the joy connected with that, and you get the rapture, the body becomes tranquil, you feel pleasure, and it, the mind becomes stilled. And when the mind is still, then you are in balance. You are unafflicted uh, as one who has entered the stream of the Dhamma. You develop recollection of the Sangha. So, uh, that is all uh, for now, because uh, time has pretty much run out for this session. Uh, so, is that right, or are we, or is, are we supposed to go longer? I've forgotten now what the, what the schedule is like. I think this is about the right time. Yes or no? Am I? Comp yeah? <laughs> okay. So we have about uh, half an hour of uh, break, and then afterwards we can do a little bit more meditation together, and then we can do a Q&A session at the end of the day. So if you have any questions on any of this,